from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased to have Joseph joining me from Sydney, Australia. Like, uh, I'm very pleased that we are starting to get more guests from that part of the world. Joseph, thank you very much for being on the show with me today. Can you please introduce yourself and what you do? Yeah. Uh, so first, thank you um, for having me on the show. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. So I'm uh, Joe for short, Joseph Azar. Um, I've been in the tech industry for professionally for 23 years, which makes me a bit seem a bit older. Um, and unprofessionally, I've been, you know, uh, since I was 12 years old, in, involved in the tech industry, computers and programming and all of that. Um, I've been, well, um, I guess since I've moved to Sydney, I've been the CTO for a company called Foresight Helmets. Um, we mass produced the first ECE certified smart motorcycle helmet in the world. Uh, I've been with them for five years now and I've moved on. Well, I'm still consulting with them, but I've uh, opened my own company, uh, which is Azar Consulting, uh, because, you know, I want to help other uh, tech startups and companies with uh, their tech products and scaling up. Um, and yeah, it's been an exciting journey. That's it's indeed an exciting journey, Joseph. Like, um, you know, like what you have done. I mean, with with the four sides. Um, so it's like the first, uh, as you mentioned, uh, smart motorcycle helmet. Can you walk us through the initial stages of developing, you know, the product and what were the main challenges and how did you overcome them? Yeah. So. Um... Just to, to clarify something, there's, it's not the first smart helmet in the world. Mm. It's the first mass-produced smart helmet in the world mm -hmm. in the sense that there's a lot of companies that try to, to create their own smart helmet. Uh, some of them had heads-up displays. Some of them had, um, you know, just uh, comms uh, integrated. Unfortunately, all of them failed. Um, and the reason for that, I think, in my opinion, is because they overshot the features. So they've promised the customers so many features that were, they weren't able to actually, um, you know, get into the market. And, um, with foresight, we were always grounded and we were always, you know, we always had our feet on the ground in the sense that. We never over promised customers things that we couldn't deliver and we didn't think that were technically possible. And, um, you know, we, we all were in, in the office, we're all motorcycle riders. We, this is a passion more than a, than a product that we wanted to get into the market. We wanted to get it ourselves first. And then, um, hopefully because of our passion, then we can get customers involved in the journey and and this has been uh you know uh i guess our goal since day one to get our customers involved in the journey so the product was kind of developed with customers uh feedback so since the inception of the idea and since we came up with the idea it was always uh you know uh hey, guys, what do you think of this? Or, hey, what do you think of including that feature in the product? So it grew from just an idea on a napkin to 
a 6,000, uh, you know, a member group on Facebook, which then evolved into us asking the customers what they wanted and them coming back to us saying, yes, we think this feature is, is a good one and this one we wouldn't be using. Um, and yeah, I guess here we are now, five years later, we have 6,000 products sold in the market. Uh, we cover USA, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and parts of Europe. That's great, Joseph. To, yeah. Yeah. to go back to, to your question, the hurdles. Well, besides mm -hmm. pandemic, two years uh, in lockdown in Sydney, I don't know if you guys had the uh, same issue on your end, but we were locked in um, our houses for two years which means, you know, it makes it difficult for us to work together and collaborate, especially if it's a hardware product. Um, and then we had uh, so many delays on uh, components because, you know, mm. it, it's a product that's created in Australia, developed in Australia, but it's manufactured in Taiwan. So trying yeah. to, to organize the shipment of components um, you know, the delays from uh, lockdowns, delays from, I guess, you know, shipping and freight forwarding issues because of the pandemic. And uh, yeah, that, that was our main, I guess, our main hurdles of uh, technology. Yeah, that's, that's great to, to, you know, to hear the story and how you overcame it. We were lucky uh, here in Dubai because um, we just set, in, in, in the houses for two months, I believe that time, I believe it was from mid April up to, and in May, everything started not to become normal, of course, but you know, we were allowed to, to move at least. So, uh, and this is something I have to give the credit. They handled here, you know, from government perspective, very, very well. We didn't, uh, we didn't, uh, face this at all. So, um, you mentioned something, Joseph, which, you know, like immediately something came to my mind. Yep. You go ahead. You, you talked about how was important not to put all the features and then slowly, slowly build uh, the product. And I want to hear, you know, from you about why this is important in startups in general. Because what we see, you know, sometimes founders they became so excited about their ideas and they want to build the whole thing from day one. So if you can. Shed some light on, on this part from your experience as well, why this is very crucial and important in startups. Yeah, so uh, I guess um, it, it's not based on, um, I would say it's not just based on not including all of the features from day one, right? Because mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a balance between you know, your vision, your imagination, and what can and can't be achieved, right? So uh, with, with Foresight, it was, to be honest, we, we all want the Iron Man experience, right? We want to put yeah. on a helmet and then be able to see things the way Iron Man does. But, and, and that's one of the reasons we, we actually went into the project because we wanted that experience. But, you know, um, uh, first of all, Iron Man is a Marvel comic and then, uh, the technology is not there, right? So everyone wants to put AR in a helmet or AR in a glass, in glasses, or, you know, now Apple's, uh, new, uh, product is out in the market. It's, I think the technology is not there yet because we expect it to, to achieve more than what it can technologically, if I, if I can say, so mm -hmm. it's, it's both, it's you trying to gauge the expectation because you want customers to actually buy the product, try it out and actually have a fun and interesting experience, right? Because right. that's the whole point of, of, um, you know, putting the product out there at the same time, you don't want to over promise things that you can't achieve. So it was always a balance between 
our passion, our vision, our imagination, and what we can and can't achieve. And I think from day one, if you, if you think of any product that's going out in the market, uh, you want the customer to actually enjoy it and use it and, and it providing some kind of value. So if you go to the customer and say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to you know, put, put a rocket on the moon, and then you end up giving them something that's, I wouldn't say 90%, it's, it's always 20% of what you promise, right? So if you manage to not put all of the promises from day one and say, mm -hmm. okay, this is what we're going to achieve, this is what the product's going to do, and we're going to try to push the boundaries, but if we can't, we can't, but we're going to try, right? Mm -hmm. And then from day one, when you launch a product, you need to keep something in the back burner, right? Because if you give them all of the features in one go, then why would anyone, you know, keep coming back, right? Because you, you want them to keep coming back um, with new ideas, new features, new uh, things that your product can deliver. And that's why we try to stop at an MVP, uh, as you call it in the, in the startup world. Uh, and the MVP is always what can be achieved with whatever technology you're using. And then later on, go for, you know, the, the next phase and give more features and give, um, I guess, more upgrades. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And I agree with you, Joseph. And my way, and not even in like for startups, is usually set expectation with the customer that you are sure you can do and actually try to overachieve it. So like under promise instead of exactly, over promise. Yes. Yeah. And right. That's so, my approach to everything. Um, over, always under promise, overachieve. Yeah, and the customers love it because, you know, when, when, you, when someone expects from you, let's say, this pen, and then you give them, you know, the nice, you know, styled, uh, you know. Yeah, know, definitely. You know, with, with, with a brand or something, they will appreciate it much. And because this is also, I'm mentioning this for fellow, you know, startup founders. And this will give you also, guys, authority and will give you authenticity and will give you also, like, people will give trust in you and in your startup in the future. Now, Joseph, one yeah, thing, and, and it yeah, also please, depends ahead. on um, integrity and honesty, and, you know, being yeah. very um, transparent to the customer, because unfortunately, once you lose that trust, you can't gain it back, right? 100%. So you always need to, to have this two-way trust between you and your customers, uh, because you don't want to get to a point where they say, oh, but yeah, they've, they've always, you know, said we're going to release this and, and they never did. Like, look at, and I, I don't mean to, you know, um, I guess uh, talk negatively about Tesla, but look at uh, the whole Tesla approach about, uh, you know, having a, an automated uh, self-driving car, right? This was the whole point of having a Tesla. And now, right. like a few years later, we don't even have, you know, a decent, uh, self-driving car. So the, the over-promising customers to get them to buy in is not a good thing because it eventually, you know, gets you to a point where nobody believes what you say. 100%, 100%, Joseph. Now, one thing also you mentioned, and I want to ask you also how this was crucial for you at Foresight and, you know, in general, you went listening to your customers and you mentioned like you had a Facebook group. Yep. How important to keep listening to your customers down the, down the road? And for you, for example, um, you know, how you are handling, you know, the demand uh, or maybe sometimes, you know, some customers might give negative feedback as well. So how do you prepare yourself also to be humble, let's say, when, when, when dealing in listening or talking directly to your customer? Yeah, well, it's difficult, I would say. Uh... You know, I've, I've been in the industry for quite some time and it's never easy to listen to bad feedback, you know, especially if you have an emotional investment in the product that you, you've made, because, you know, it's kind of like um, somebody coming and, and saying bad things about your kids, no matter how bad your kids are, 
you still love them and you still care for them and you feel insulted and offended if somebody talks negatively about them. So um, I would say try to, to approach it in a mature, um, distant way, but still kind of have a balance between uh, your emotional involvement in it, but at the same time, uh, you know, see it from their perspective. I think the thing that, that um, most founders maybe lack because of their visionary uh, personality is empathy, right? So because you need to feel how your customers feel about your product so that you can then understand where they're coming from and be able to use the, this feedback in enhancing your product. And I would say uh, another, um, I would say, advice would be don't implement everything that customers ask for, right? Because you have customers asking for, you know, um, things that, that you can't achieve. Um, some of them ask for um, features that may or may not be worth including in your product. Uh, you need to filter that information and use analytic to determine what can and can't be included in the future uh, release, right? So um, I'll give you an example. The way we, we did it in Foresight is um, we, we, take, we take all of the requests of our customers, we filter them down, we pick the top 10, and then mm -hmm. we post uh, in, in the group a poll saying, what, what do you guys think? Uh, pick based on the features that you like and uh, rate the ones, you know, starting from 10 to one. And mm -hmm. then take that feedback and then pick the top three and work on those top three. Very, this very way, good way. Well, this way you can kind of gauge what brings in benefit and what mm -hmm. doesn't and what the majority of your customers do, not just one person asking for one feature. You want the, the majority of, of the customers to, to weigh in. 100% Joseph, and I can give my experience from also consulting perspective, um, you know, especially when you work with uh, startups that you are trying to get their products in front of um, clients. Yep. Um, you know, one way, you know, for founders, actually, like you, the way you mentioned is very straightforward and uh, it will give them even some metrics, but other way uh, on the long run, maybe you start to ask, okay, is it like something have to have, or is it good to have? Uh, yeah, because, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because, you know, sometimes we need, and it depends of course, on which type of startup you are in, but sometimes, and this is on the founders and their team. We, we need to educate also our, you know, to be customer or prospect about, you know, the technology and whether, you know, is it something really, because we are trying at the end of the day, you know, to either offer something which let their life be better or maybe reduce a pain. So all startups, like they are all about that. Even if it's entertainment, by the way, you are trying to make the guy's lives, you know, more, you know, like yeah, happy. So. You need to see like the degree you need to measure and ask him, okay, do you really want this or is it good to have? So I, I think this is a good hack that I used to, 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 and I still ask and I still, you know, uh, always use it and it works because when you ask it in a question format, you know, the prospect or you to be customer or existing customer will think one moment, oh, okay, really, you know, maybe really, I don't need this feature, like uh, something just fancy on the product or whatever. Now. Yeah, uh, on, yeah, on that go ahead. subject, we had one customer ask for um, if we can integrate an air conditioning system into one of our helmets. So, um, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a bit wild, but, uh, you know, you get these customers asking for things that you can't achieve or wouldn't even be, you know, interesting uh, to have. Uh, so you have to filter them down and decide what goes in the product. Actually. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Now I want to ask you, Joseph, about you know some key leadership principles, especially like for someone who's 
going to be a CTO of a company about helping driving innovation. Like how important it is to put this culture of innovation and foster this culture. Um, can, can you provide, you know, your opinion on, on this and some, you know, examples from, from what you have done with Foresight? Yeah, so uh, I would say there it's not it's not principles it's more of a personality trait mm -hmm. um and something that i i keep like to keep focusing on is um emotional intelligence which is you know ev everybody out there is trying to to focus on iq right mm -hmm. uh, how smart you are how good with numbers you are uh and that sometimes they neglect to focus on EQ, which is, uh, you know, having empathy, having um, this uh, passion for your product, having maturity. Um, I guess in in all of the companies that I've worked in or been a part of, um, founders, not not specifically founders, but people in leadership uh, roles, they tend to forget uh, looking at things from two perspectives, right? It's not from the business perspective, it also from the employee perspective. And uh, I guess in one of the events, somebody asked about a question and um, they focused on how all these big tech companies talk about families. And I, and I say families in double quotes because they, they reference their employees as families. But then, you know, you look at the news and you see thousands and thousands of people getting laid off and you think, okay, well, why, why are you calling them family when you turn around and, you know, as soon as your bottom, bottom line is, is uh, at risk, you start laying off these people and it's it's such a such a sad thing in in the tech world because it affected so many people i was looking at some article saying 86000 employees lost their jobs because of these tech uh, companies I, I understand you know uh, it's business at the end of the day but mm -hmm. at the same time just why label them as your family when you want to turn around and, you know, lay them off? And something that I guess, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm cutting you off there, Mehmet. No, no, no. Um, yeah, so something that I, I think we managed to, to do well in Foresight is focus on our, our team as, as much as focusing on VCs and customers, right? So it's a three pillar approach. You have your VCs on one side, which is, you know, where the money is coming from. You have your customers, which you need to make happy, but you also have your employees, which you need to take care of. Because if you can't take care of your employees, your employees can't take care of you. So I guess my, my one advice, regardless of what business you're in, Focus on all of them at the same time. Don't neglect any side of your business because it might come back and bite you in the ass. Yeah. Joseph, just out of curiosity, um, Foresight were backed by, by VCs or was it like a bootstrap business? No, it's, uh, it's actually backed by a, by a VC. Well, multiple VCs. Okay. Okay. Now, just on, on, the, on the topic you mentioned, and you saw me get excited where you were talking, because, <laughs> um, because, because I can now, I can, <laughs> you know, I'm not exaggerating, but I can write maybe not one book, I can write books about this. And yep. uh, it, it touched me emotionally because I had a lot of friends working for companies, you know, tech companies, and they were let off. Um, and I like when you said, don't call them family. And, you know, honestly speaking, one of the things that 
you know, I wanted to do different in this podcast is it's not like just to, to point on them and say, you are guys all together fake or all wrong, but really I could not, you know, anymore accept, you know, seeing these posts. And I know maybe if, if someone is watching or listening, maybe some guys would be pissed off of me. That's fine. Like I can, I accept that, <laughs> but I, I, what I don't like, or I feel it like it's like a theater or a cinema, whatever you want to call it. When everything is okay, we see these guys, the same guys taking photos. I work for X hashtag. X is the best company in the world. Best technology. I have no doubt you have the good technology. And yep. then the day comes, right? And then, you know what? You discover that you were that, you know, as a one famous guy, James Welsh, uh, Justin Welsh, he meant he's very active on LinkedIn. He, he pointed out you are in a, a cell in an Excel sheet because when things start to go bad, and as you said, it's business, 100%. But yeah, don't call them family. I, I'm 100% yep. with you, Joseph, on this. Not only that, and you don't. Guys, you know, um, maybe one day I will go back to corporate world. I don't know. No one know, can predict his future. But if even I come back to corporate world, one thing, um, no, the company is not my family. It's, it's a place where I'm offering my service. I'm offering, I'm selling my time to offer my service. to. Um, this is the way how I see it because I had a lot of friends who lost their jobs. I had a lot of friends who became in depression. And what's happened with, and they are still yep. doing it because at the time of pandemic and sorry, Joseph, it should be about you, not about me, but you know, you no, brought no, a no, very of good course point. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And one, one thing that, and this is the last thing I want to mention because someone during, you know, the pandemic when all, you know, like some companies, they saw very high growth, they started to hire these people without doing any planning and then what they yep. call it a depression. Uh, you know, a, a, a recession, sorry, uh, which is no one even sure is it a recession or not. Predictably, and just not to be in trouble, let's lay off these people. Okay. Again, without planning. So this is where, you know, I, I, I have to stand and I have to say, with all due respect to the CEOs, to the founders, to the executives, to the chief of staffs in, in these companies, guys, you need to be more. I would say better at planning because, yep. and you know, you don't, and you don't need to write this, you know, uh, you know, I'm very sorry. Like we consider them part of the family. No, you don't consider them part of the family. You, they are just for you a number. And uh, yeah. as Joseph said, um, don't, don't do it. And this is for, for founders guys. If you like, don't put big, uh, I would say. Big goals for yourself if it's going to hurt people. What I mean, if you want to do IPO, but in order to do the IPO, you have to fire people and you, you know, you need to put these things in the future. Don't do it because people will not work yeah. for you anymore. Sorry, Joseph, yeah. like I, I, I took this, but no, I no, needed no, to highlight I this. I wanted to add to that though. Uh, my sure. um, I don't know if you saw a post that I had, um, I think it was last week. So something that also pissed me off was um it's not just the fact that you know they they specify or they they mention family when they're talking about their employees it's the fact that um i think what was it facebook uh, fired about six twenty thousand or twenty two thousand employees and then last week i saw uh somebody posting on linkedin saying and, and that person works in in meta uh, talking about the year-on-year -year growth of 11% this quarter just by, um, you know, focusing on their ad, uh, ad content on Meta. And I was like, you guys are, are boasting about your year-on-year -year growth after you've laid off 22,000 people. How does that look? You know, when, when you, you've been part of that layoff and you look at that and think, well, I just lost my job. Um, uh, I've been out of, uh, uh, you know, uh, out of a job for six months. And now Meta's talking about year-on-year -year growth of 11%. Yeah. 
you know that yeah. that's something that also pissed me off and and i couldn't i couldn't hold it so i had to i had to make a, a post about it no for for me joseph like and uh, what i can say about myself i cannot accept um i cannot see something which is not uh, in 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 line with justice especially for companies that they claim you know like they are human you know they are like you know they consider everyone yeah, as part of the family and, and yeah yeah definitely. so yeah it's not like mm. to to shame to shame them or it's not like to directly criticize but honestly like i got very annoyed by first hearing this news and second i'm i'm telling you know like i'm, I'm maybe some of my friends now they think like kind of my rebel and i'm telling them it's not like about being a rebel it's about like you understanding that when you are working for a company this company might lay you off anytime it might not but you have to put this into mind and you need to understand especially if it's a company backed by vcs and that's where you were mentioning this is why i asked you to yeah, yeah. like vcs they need money and then they will put their pressure on the founders and the founders will have to put pressure on their sales teams and then their sales team will put yeah. pressure on 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 you as an employee and it's like an endless loop of pressure and stress and you see people you know like getting mental health issues you see people under stress all the time for what guys for what because a couple of vcs yeah, exactly. they are not happy with the performance anyway yeah. <laughs> like it, it, but it was rest. a good yeah 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 it was it was a good you know like i felt <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, it's also like, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Now well, let's, let's, glad. let's shift gears. Yeah. Yep. Let's shift gears like with Joseph, like, and talk about your own consulting company and, you know, you've tailored, you are offering yep. what's called virtual CTO services uh, to suit different startups. Yeah, I think um, it's, uh, you know, they, they labeled it so many, in, in so many ways, you've got fractional CTO, you've got mm -hmm. virtual CTO, you've got uh, CTO as a service. Uh, so I didn't know what to choose. So I went with the first option available to the virtual Good. CTO, but it's actually, it's not a, it's, it's one of the services that I, that I'm providing. It's not the main service, but it's mm -hmm. something to, to kind of cater to all of the tech startups or the startups that are, you know, um, launching a product. And the thing is, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I can't just get involved in the tech. I get involved in everything. So every company that brings me in, you know, I end up uh, advising them on sales, end up advising them on marketing, even though it's not my area of expertise but and i and i make sure that they understand that i tell them based on my experience this is what i've seen in the market and this is what i've seen work and not work uh, yeah so it's very difficult to uh, for me it's very difficult to separate myself from the from the product and from that customer when i'm talking to them right because it's not about getting paid and then going home and you know, whatever happens, happens. To me, it's more about the partnership in the sense that I'd like to see them succeed because then I can, I can, you know, feel better about myself. I can sleep better at night knowing that I've helped somebody. Um, if I get paid for it, great. If I don't get paid for it, sometimes I do it for free just because I have this you know passion for the product and what this company is doing that's great so, i yeah. think joseph we are seeing we are seeing more yeah. of this by the way like having you know a fractional uh, not only ctos i i i started yeah, to fractional everything actually same yeah do you think there's a reason for that and is it related to what we were discussing just a couple of minutes back uh i i don't actually know, you know, I, I thought about it, but I think it's more about how um, more startups are trying to bootstrap their business instead of relying mm -hmm. heavily on VCs, like you said. So, you know, bootstrapping a business is not an easy thing, right? You have to have a high risk tolerance and a somehow a bit of a deep pocket to be able to 
you know, uh, launch a business and, and believe in your business enough to invest your own money into it. Um, and the, you know, the reason more fractional C level, uh, is, is popping up is because then they can hire you for a small period of time, you know, benefits from your experience and, and whatever you can bring to the, to the business and then turn that tap off whenever, you know, uh, cash is tight. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, that's a, it's a good thing because, um, you know, um, more companies can, can use C-level employees with large experience without having to, you know, hire them for a year or two years or, uh, you know, a long period of time. That's true. And this is exactly the same feedback. And actually, it's a win-win for both uh, direction, I would say, or for both the um, stakeholders. Because for startup founders, they don't have to put a lot of maybe salaries and maybe give some... Uh, uh, you know, some shares and some equity maybe to, to, to these co-founders. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And on yeah. the other side, it gives people, and by the way, I do the same, Joseph, as well. So it gives us like an opportunity to be working with multiple technologies at the same time, multiple startups at the same time, which is like a nice experience. Like, you know, like now it's, it's good to, to be on the kind of a consultant um, where you help them in you become their CMO as a service, your CTO as a service, or CRO as a service as chief revenue officer. So all this, uh, I think it's a win-win situation. But as usual, I'm not saying this will be mainstream because you know no one can predict the the future. <laughs> and pandemic, as you mentioned yeah, at the sure. beginning, like was the the first the the, yeah. the main thing. That let us know not everything can be predictable, but it's a mainstream, and I believe it has to do also with all these people who were let off and they know they can offer their services. So maybe it's also like igniting, I would say this. Now, yeah. Joseph, what like, kind of when, when, uh, services do you provide? So, so for Is me, it's like similar to virtual or fractional CTO. Okay. So I'm, uh, yeah, so I don't call it fractional, you know, I, I call it like co-founder as a service, like, and because, you know, I, okay. I, I have, I have experience in both business and tech. So, it's whether they want to build an MVP. So I, I don't build the MVP myself, but can I advise them, you know, on which route they can go if they want to go and expand in a new market. So maybe they are in, in Europe and they want to start in the Middle East. So they don't know anything about the market. Okay. So this is where yeah. I can advise these startups. But they will be mainly like not startups anymore. Maybe they start to become a scale up. Then they are looking for new markets to, to join. So yeah, and put them, you know, like go-to-market strategies, like the distribution channel and all these yeah. details. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is, yeah, I, I don't, I, <laughs> thank you well, for asking. So, I never, so I never that, mean that uh, all of the information I'm, I'm uh, discussing with you is now, uh, you know, you're going to take it and, and uh, use it as your own, that, that how it is, because, you know, we're both competing towards the same customers. No, no, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Yeah. I, I don't, okay. I, I, oh, okay. So this is good to mention. So when it comes to the CTO and service, I, I go for the local startups. I, you know, um, the only, the only place where I go and I have geographically, you know, set up myself in, in Middle East, North Africa region. So this is where yeah. I play. So I, I'm not after your clients, Joseph, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't actually believe that there's competition. I mean, you know, it's a big market. Everybody gets their own share. And uh, if, if uh, you know, we can benefit from each other's uh, knowledge and experience, that, that benefits yeah. everybody. It's a win-win situation. 100%. Yeah. And Joseph, because you're working with multiple companies now and multiple startups, like, it's like maybe a, a traditional question, but again, I, I'm, I'm, you know, interested to see um, what are some of, you know, the um, upcoming innovative technologies that you you think it will be, uh, um, can become the next trend or can be, become the next hype? Like, what are you seeing in that space? Wow, okay. That's, um, that's a difficult question to answer. Um... You know, I, I would say that the default one would be AI. Any, any now, it's so funny that, you know, 
with like being in this industry for so long, you kind of start to see the patterns happen. Um, mm -hmm. It was, uh, first of all, it was, um, let's say in, in the early nineties or the early two thousands, it was, um, websites with flash or action script then it was called uh cloud um you know back then it was just website back end front end tech uh, the full stack now it's called cloud then you uh see the emergence of smart technology which is you know connected devices or connected uh, uh internet of things and now yes. I think the latest hype or the latest rage is AR. So you see so many tech startups, you know, um, having pr products that have nothing to do with AI, but then they put the AI label, you know, at the beginning of the name. And it's like VC come and pour money into it. Do you guys have AI? No. Okay. Why did you put AI uh, in the name? Oh, because, you know, VCs can then give us more money. So, it, yeah. you know, I, I think um, AI has a lot of potential. Uh, it, the, the way that it's being used is, is amazing. And I would say it's not a hype in the sense that it's at the beginning of the hype, but there's so many things that you can do with it. And it's only getting started. So um, hopefully, I think um, we would probably, and I, I'm, I'm guessing we started seeing, you know, AI on the edge, AI in, in uh, devices, AI in uh, the cloud, you know. Um, everybody wants to include uh, artificial intelligence or LLMs technology. So um, I would say that's one of them. Uh, anything else that comes to mind um yeah i think i think that's the the latest rage now and web3 i guess but web3 i never actually or uh, well from that's that's a personal uh perspective i guess i never saw it materializing into something that could be um you know like a like a, a trend setting i saw mm -hmm. it as maybe like a, a, a novel way of doing things, but it's not that, you know, it's not like a new technology to be used, even though it is, but it's smart. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, and also I mean, blockchain yes, was, was uh, hyping up, but never achieved anything important, unfortunately. Except I it's think, a uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. I, I think this is exactly why nothing happened because people started to uh, to tie blockchain to cryptocurrencies, and I think this is where they, they you know, in my opinion, the biggest uh, challenge for the technology is people. They start to think that any time the world blockchain um, is included in a in a yeah, product or service. Yes. Oh my God. They would say well, that means uh, it's a cryptocurrency and, uh, you know, it will not be good to, to do it, blah, 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 blah. So, which is, uh, not the case, but anyway, um, yeah, but I yeah. agree with you yeah, on, on the other yeah. ones. I will agree with you on the other ones, Joseph. And I think there will be kind of, um, blending between technologies sometimes. So mixing AI with something else to take it to another level. Um, I, I can see this, um, Joseph, like we've been like same, I think we, we shared the same thing. We've been in the, in the market for a long time. So how do you keep yourself updated with all the new trends and, you know, the news and technologies? Well, what's your secret sauce? Let's say. Secret sauce. Uh, well, I sleep very little. Um, yeah, so um, I I wake up at five o'clock in the morning. Mm. I work out about an hour, an hour and a half. While working out, I read. You know, basically, I think if you're involved in technology, you need to read a lot. 
and and process a lot of information and and um I guess one of the reasons I joined the the, the tech industry and in computers back then it wasn't tech it was you know computer science from my perspective is because it was my passion since you know I can remember and some some people you know join it because they you know, wanted to find, sorry, <laughs> sorry about the no noise. Uh, yeah, no so, uh, the reason I, I joined, uh, you know, computer science was because I, I, I had passion for it and I wanted to get involved in that, that side of the business, uh, or mm-hmm. that side of uh, technology. And, uh, the way I keep myself, uh, updated is get my hands dirty um you know where this turn hands on hand hands off i'm very hands yes. on um everything that i was a part of i built or i started building in the beginning and then handed off the work to somebody else it wasn't it's not a theoretical thing for me it's more of uh, you know actually working and implementing something myself and uh mm-hmm. yeah i Subscribe to so many news uh, um, outlets. Uh, I read a lot of uh, tech uh, summaries, tech documentaries, tech documents. And um, something that I, I like to keep saying, it's a saying for me. If you're not up to date, you're out of date. So yeah. that's how it is for me. Great. Yeah, yeah I, I can say more or less we... we... You know, this is also my uh, my way of getting updates. So recently, I started even to try to leverage AI because I was subscribing to a lot of feeds. So now I, you know, I I can give some of these feeds and ask AI to summarize them to me. So instead of me going all of all of them, uh, um, because uh, you know, with with the, you know the start of the podcast, so I need to prepare. I need to. So, but I need to keep up to date also as well about what's happening around me. So I start to leverage AI, but yeah, yeah like I, I, was, I was reading your uh, last post. What was it? 11 podcasts in one week. How did you manage that? <laughs> yeah. Sleep? Uh, no. uh, uh, yeah, I can say healthily. Yeah. I get like, at least, <laughs> okay, I get good. at least, I get at least like, uh, let's go minimum six hours, uh-huh. I would say. Six, six hours, six yeah. To seven. I mean, yeah, six to seven. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the max for me. Yeah, and also I, I, I am, you know, the early birds club. So, except on the weekend, yeah, the weekdays, I, I, I wake up four thirty. Uh, so because okay. you know, I, I do also like kind of forty five. That as you, but it's like it's a bike or a jogging, and uh, yeah, then yeah. then. You know, I would be doing, you know, a, I would be reading a book and then I would be preparing for the podcast or releasing a podcast. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. So, yeah. yeah but, but, for, but, but, you know, by, by, by mid time, I'm done and I have the whole afternoon. So either I will be doing meetings with clients or, you know, like, uh, you know, like people think that, you know, a lot of tasks you do, but believe me, you can achieve a lot. That maybe you are at night guy if someone is listening i can understand you as well and you might be doing it in the opposite way so you finish a lot of tasks and a lot of projects at night so yeah 100 percent uh joseph like uh, as 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 we coming to an end i have a very famous question um anything you wish yep. i had asked you and how you would answer it wow okay um Is, should it, should that be a ph- philosophical question or can it be anything? It, 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 it can be anything. Um, I haven't thought of it, but uh, I would say um, if I'm going to the Middle East anytime soon and uh, I would answer it by saying yes. <laughs> oh, good. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. When we gonna <laughs> when we gonna when we gonna see you here in Dubai? Oh well, um, I've been planning. Yeah, I've been planning to come to Dubai for a while now. Uh, 
But, you know, everybody keeps telling me, wait, wait until November, September, November, until the weather gets better. Is that true? Is it November? Uh, you know, like, of course, now some people, it depends on how, I would say your, your body resistance to, to the weather conditions, right? So, um, if, if you can handle uh, in degrees Celsius, like uh, for people who are listening from North America, if you can, if you can handle yeah. 40, 42 with a high uh, humidity, like up to, I would say sometime 80, 90%. Wow. By the way, that, that like, sounds like, harsh. Yeah. But you know what I hear from some people, especially, you know, Westerns who, who, who've been living in Southeast Asia and they tell me about the yep. weather conditions. So it's, it's not like more bad than there, like Singapore or, uh, or Malaysia or any other place in Southeast Asia. Yeah. yeah, yeah definitely. It, it can become hot. Yeah. Of course, like the weather is amazing between, I would say mid October up to end of April. So from weather perspective, but from business perspective, yep. You know, the country is open for business, I would say, all, all the year. Yeah, and we, we, you know, like now it, it was July and, you know, and I did some, some, you know, um, you know, visits and I was roaming around the city and I saw, you know, it's buzzing actually. So, yeah. So, so yeah, so that's, that's uh, good to hear, Joseph, like you would be oh, yeah. uh, here. Uh, I thought about a question that, um, you know, that I, I think, um, maybe you should have sure. asked. But didn't, um, yeah, so there's, there's, uh, something that all startups or all businesses ask about, and, um, it's been, um, a topic of discussion for a while for me, at least, uh, is that they, they wonder, or they, they think that the cost of automating their business is high. So they never mm -hmm. invest or never anyone to, um, you know. Um, a look into it. And, um, I mean, I've, I've been asked this question so many times, like how much would it cost to automate our business? And they think, you know, it's a very big or very large investment. And my answer has always been, uh, the same and is, and it's, what is the cost of not automating your business? Right? Because. Yeah. Um, you know, doing, doing, because startups don't have a lot of money to invest in hiring people. So, um, they end up doing the work themselves, like business owners or, uh, founders, and they, they end up, you know, struggling to find time to have a work life balance and, um, eventually miss out on some of the things that they could do because of the lack of time. And that's, that's why I always say, you know. Think about what you could lose if you don't automate your business and, uh, you'll find out the cost, uh, then. Right. hundred percent. And thank you for bringing this Joseph, because also I'm, I'm may maybe you have seen this as well. I'm very big fan of automating. Um, and for me, anything that I repeat more than two times, I, the first thing I start to you think automate, about right? how, 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 how I yeah, can automate. <laughs> Yeah. And I tell, I tell businesses like guys, you know, you, you might be sitting on a gem because if you automate, you know, these tasks, and I'm talking here, not about all these startups, I'm talking even about small, medium businesses, telling them guys, like if, if we automate, you know, like these three steps, um, you know, this guy who's doing these repetitive tasks, he might be so talented that he can for example, help you in your marketing instead of doing data entry, just exactly. for per, exactly. per se. Uh, or for example, you know, like if, if you are losing your time on, you know, following up in spreadsheets, who you should call next, like you could have automated all this and you don't need to be the, there. You can automate your calendar. You can automate your email communications. Of course, yeah. still you need exactly. supervision. And by the way, this is not AI. I'm not, I'm not doing any hype and Joseph is not doing any hype. It's just automation. You, you can do a lot of automations, uh, over there. So 
Uh, and yeah, actually, it doesn't have to always be a, a custom made automation. It could be, you know, you using some kind of system that's online. You can subscribe to it, uh, pay 10 bucks a month and get it done, right? 100%. But if you don't look at your business and how repetitive tasks are wasting your time, then you never look into how you can automate these things and make your business faster. Right, right, hundred, hundred percent, Joseph. I and that this is one part of also like what uh, I try to convey to startup founders and to small medium businesses. And I start to see some traction because the concept um, they know about it, but they needed guidance. And this is where people like yourself yeah. and me comes into the picture, so we can put a, a lot. Joseph, where can people find more about you? Where uh, they can well, find you? First of all, I guess uh, the website, which is uh, azarconsulting.com.au, uh, mm -hmm. or you, they can hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, just yeah. look me up. I'm the big guy with a uh, black t-shirt. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, they, these are the um, easiest ways of uh, finding me, I guess. That's great. I'll make sure that I include all these uh, links in the episode description. Thank Joseph, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much for being on the show today. And uh, uh, I hope Thank you, man. You know, what we discussed today, um, you know, it will resonate with, with uh, some of our audience. And as usual, this is how I end my episodes. Guys, if you're listening to us, watching this, uh, don't hesitate to tell me your feedback. I'm always open to hear your feedback. If you are interested to be a guest on the show as well, you have an inspiring story you want to tell us. It doesn't have to be always technology, but it should be related to startup and entrepreneurship. Don't be shy. Hit me with an email also as well or uh, on LinkedIn, and I will be more than happy to arrange it. I have, you know, guests from all around the world. I'm blessed by having, uh, you know, this mix. And also, uh, as I, as I said, uh, keep the feedbacks coming. I'm enjoying reading them. And until we meet in the next episode, thank you very much. Bye.